Um, yeah, welcome to the online launch of the latest wheel briefing paper on zero waste. Um, a topic that is such an important part of the move towards a well-being economy. So well-being economy, of course, is about creating an economy that is in service to people's well-being, uh, the well-being of our communities and the well-being of our planet. And looking at the amount of waste that is being produced on a daily basis, um, it's clear that, of course, all of this waste and our throwaway societies are neither serving our well-being nor are they looking after the well-being of our planet. So my name uh, is Marguerite Freeling. I'm one of the knowledge colleagues for the Welding Economy Alliance. Um, and in today's session, we will be hearing from Malin Lett, who's been the lead author of the Zero Waste paper um, about some of the core themes that she's been discussing in the paper, as well as some of the brilliant case studies that she um, uh, has incorporated in there. And then um, Maggie Lee is joining us as well. Um, she's the regional head at the WWF, the Worldwide Fund for Nature. And she will share some of her reflections on the paper and, and, and engage in a bit of a dialogue with uh, Malin before we'd love to open up the floor to all of you uh, to also share your reflections and your thoughts and um, questions on this topic of zero waste. So I'd like to start by introducing Malin. Um, Malin holds a master's degree in leadership for, sustainable, uh, for sustainability from Malmö University in Sweden. She has a strong passion for participatory governance um, and regenerative processes. She's co-created several tools, such as the Method Kit for Sustainable Organization, um, and she's helped us to build our policy design guide, as well as working on a zero waste business model canvas. Um, she currently leads a market transformation initiative for a circular plastics economy and is co-authoring a report on structural barriers and norms in the transition towards a circular economy in Sweden. So before I hand over the floor to you, Malin, I just want to acknowledge all of the dedication and the commitment that has gone into the paper that Malin will be presenting on today. Um, so often these papers are, are uh, written in addition to people's uh, full-time work. So I just want to express our enormous gratitude for all the work that you've put in. Um, and with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Malin, as we're really looking forward to, the, to your presentation. So the floor is all yours. Thank you so much for, for the nice introduction, Marguerite. And I would just like to, to add, before I start the presentation, where I will lift some, some of the key uh, aspects of the, the briefing paper, that this has been a, a collective effort since, I don't know, maybe three years in the wider membership. So I really would like to thank everybody who has been in this process from the very start until the, the end of this uh, this briefing paper. It's been a pleasure to work with you all. And I noticed I see some, some names that I recognize and some organizations as well. So I'm super happy to that you are with us today. So I will just start and share my screen. Now, I think you will see uh, the first slide on the presentation, correct? Yes. So I will just make this smaller. Yeah. So to start with, uh, I would like to introduce you to the the uh, the vision that was uh, faced out in the or stated in the in the briefing paper that we explored a lot in the the beginning of the work which is uh, where we started at is, as, as Marguerite introduced with what the core elements are in the well-being economy and how that taps into a zero waste uh, vision um, and also the different processes of, of how we use and, and, and uh, utilize different flows of materials or products. So the, the vision for a zero waste well-being economy is that all resources will be valued and that there will be no waste. It's also about how we will foster um, a culture that recognizes the true value of plants, minerals, and animals that support us, and that we will use them sparingly. And what's stated on, on this slide is, is last bits of, of the vision statement that I would love to share with you today. And it goes as, as this. Our creative energies and talents will be directed towards generating the greatest well-being from the least material consumption by reusing all that we've already taken and given back as much as we've been given. So this is like the core the core essence. And, and I think you can all uh, resonate with that also from a wellbeing economy perspective, um, but in, in a zero waste approach, 
it's it's way more uh, prominent because that would be like the the uh, basic foundation on how we would need to to think about how we use and and produce. And so in this, in in approaching this type of vision, there are of course challenges, and some of them are stated in the briefing paper. That um, that we see would be one of the key uh, aspects to or key barriers to overcome. And those are planned obsolescence, the decline of the repairing economy, the rise of single use plastics, forever chemicals and other synthetic products, advertisement and the creation of hyper consumption cultures and prices of raw materials. So this is like a mix of, of both uh, how we behave and how we look at, at things and how we look at processes and flows but also like the, the foundation of how, how um, pricing and, and use are structured also policy-wise. Um, and to, uh, to work with these uh, different challenges and to find a way out in terms of like altering the path or making this, this shift that we need, um, there are some, some things to think about how we could approach that. And we sat in the group um, both some years ago and also last, I think it was maybe two years ago, we thought about how could we structure a way in, in concretizing this, or making it more concrete and making it more um, yeah, easier to grasp. And in science, it's, it's uh, quite common, I would say, in, in some articles to use the R's, and that's what we chose to. So taking action for a zero waste well-being economy or approaching zero waste in a well-being economy where we need efforts from businesses, governments, and, and communities. Um, it could be uh, inspired by, by actions taking, led by the, the five R's. And the five R's are refuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, and restore. And uh, so these are just words, of course, that all happen to, to start with an R. Um, we have also uh, added some, some, some body to it, so to speak. So it's about refusing, it's about uh, refusing business as usual, the use of non-renewable materials, and the production of unnecessary items. Reducing is about reducing linear production models and processes and move towards more circular and regenerative processes. Reusing is what it, what it means. It's like reusing a product or material um, over and over again, so recirculating it. Uh, and it could also be by terms of looking at refilling, repurposing, repairing. There are many, many other um, activities to take on in the reuse uh, strategy. And then it's about recycling whatever there is that is left for material recycling, and then to restore the planets from, from the harm caused of our current uh, linear production processes and consumption patterns. Um, so those, those would be like a, a strategic approach to more easily grasp what might be a guidance in, in actions taken. And uh, of course, none of these R's are new to the global society. They have been here for forever um, or for many, many years. And because of that, I would like to showcase uh, different cases that are already happening. Um, we crowdsourced this throughout the uh, wider membership in the beginning uh, with some different cases. In the briefing paper, you will see cases from uh, businesses, communities, and governments on all of these R's. And I will show you one case per, per R. Um, and then if you would like to read more of them, please feel free to, to check the, the briefing paper. Um, but so the first one would be about refusing. And this is an inspiring example from Japan. Uh, a town called Kamikatsu, where communities have been working to reduce waste by having the mindset of refusal. And that means refusing to accept waste generation and looking at how could we enable the community to work even more with sorting for material recycling and then analyze and look at what's, whatever is left and what could be either substituted or, yeah, what options are there? Like if we don't want to have uh, waste that wouldn't be uh, sorted for recycling, then what, what options are there? So they have been very successful in this, and now they are 
80% zero waste to landfill. Probably uh, it's, that number would be a bit higher uh, because that number is uh, maybe a couple of years ago. And they are sorting the waste into 45 different categories. And I would say, of course, it's not like uh, we could have an, an endless number of, of um, categories because it also depends on what we buy uh, and what, uh, what will be uh, on the market uh, there. But it's interesting to see how, how they have um, coordinated these efforts with participatory uh, processes with the people living there and how that had uh, strengthened the the um, like um, the long life of this transition. Another example, looking at uh, um, the uh, Recycling Council in Alberta on reducing, is uh, that they um, started this uh, circular communities project with the aim to reduce waste and increase circulation of products and materials. And they were inspired by uh, the Sharing City Initiative and a Living Economy Action Plan that both work a lot with collaborative solutions and, and participatory processes where you try to find solutions to reduce waste and, and material uh, consumption. And some of the ideas that came out of, of these processes were the uh, programs to redistribute food that would otherwise be, be thrown away. Uh, let's continue with uh, the third case that's about reuse. So this is a, a business case and we have many of them already um, working that, that are up and running in a, in a larger scale as well. And this is reuse, this is about reuse models. When you go to a cafe, buy a cup of coffee or tea, uh, and then you pay a deposit, a refundable deposit fee and after you're using, you have been using the cup, drinking your coffee, you can return it to any participating store in that system and get back the deposit. Um, so that would be a, a, a way of, of trying to scale up a, a reusable scheme on, on specifically coffee cups. Um, and then we have Recycle, where we have one example from the Philippines, the city of Alaminos. Um, that went from pile burning to, to um, material recycling. And that was basically from, a, or a part of it, I would say, would be from the uh, no sorting, no collection policy. And that means that if you wouldn't sort your, your waste into different categories, uh, it would not be collected. And this was a, a successful example. They also did other activities, I would, I would add to that. But um, this, through the, the main, main elements of, of this project, was also participatory processes, looking at knowledge sharing, awareness raising, um, and they got this sense of, of um, co-ownership uh, that made this, um, this activity and this, uh, this recycling example very successful. Um, and the last one, Restore, we have a, an example from the municipality of Curitabat in, in Costa Rica that granted citizenship to pollinators. That could be bees, hummingbirds, bats and butterflies, also with native uh, plants and trees. And I remember when we, we talked about or had the, the sessions around the different cases and we looked at uh, what's, uh, what's the essence of restoration, because it's not only giving back what we have been taking, but also restoring the functionality of, of the, the specific um, area, including how, how the ecosystem has been functioning. And, and um, one way uh, of, of doing so is this case lifted in the briefing paper. And this um, is a way to, to make sure or to enable the possibility of, of a city to better plan for for the benefit of, of both human and non-human citizens. And in so they have been looking at water management, investment in green infrastructure and biocorridors um, and other activities, and also participatory design processes. And as you might have heard throughout these cases, participatory design and participatory processes has been uh, very essential in all of this. And I think both because we, we from the Wellbeing Economy Alliance wider membership network, we have, of course, a sense of, of the Wellbeing Economic Projects, but then also we could easily see that that's 
that element is so essential in in many trans in many transformational uh, processes. Um, yeah, so the conclusion of all of this would be that um, it's, of course, uh, it comes with barriers when we try to alter the path or to move from something that we are taking for granted and maybe not thinking about the consequences intended or unintended. Um, so in this transition, we know that we need to find ways and making it um, easy for governments, for municipalities, and also for us as individuals and organizations to take proper action. And we do believe that the hours that were set out in this paper could, could help us to, to find ways to, as a collective, rethink and redesign how the, the city and the community and the society operates. So thinking about refusing, reducing, reusing, recycling, and restoring could be of a help. And we also would like to highlight that when we're looking at different activities to, to address the problem, we have to make sure that we, of course, addressing the root causes, because otherwise it might not be um, resulting in the, in the shift in a path that we would like to see and that we need to see. So this was uh, a brief report on, on um, what the briefing paper is all about. And I would love to, to hear your comments and uh, please feel free to read it if you haven't already. Uh, and I think there would be loads of inspirational and inspiring uh, cases that would add to this. So thank you very much. And also thank you so much for the wider membership network for the inputs uh, to this paper. Fantastic. <clears throat> Thanks so much, um, Malin, for that, uh, for that great presentation. Um, I think the five hours are such a useful framing. And what I love about this is I think the well-being economy movement is not about demystifying um, the ideas that keep us stuck in our current economic systems, but also to demonstrate that alternative ways of doing things are actually possible. Uh, and that's one of the things that I personally really appreciated about this paper, how it's full of examples of that this is actually already happening in so many places around the world and hopefully that can provide inspiration um, for all of us working on different parts of things. Um, so um, I would like to then now introduce you to our second speaker, um, Maggie Lee, who, as I mentioned, is the regional head for the Asia Pacific, Europe and North Africa region for the WWF, um, focused on impact monitoring and reporting. So prior to working for WWF, um, Maggie worked for Vera, I hope I'm pronouncing, pronouncing that right, Maggie, um, which is an environmental standards leader, um, as well as the United Nations Environmental Programme. And she spent um, 10 years in research and development and technical affairs for large retail uh, companies. So like Malin, she really knows the topic uh, inside and out. So today, Maggie is joining us here as her own beautiful individual person, rather than necessarily representing the views of the organizations um, that she's worked for. So we're really happy, so happy, um, Maggie, that you could join us for this session today. Um, and I'd love to hand over the floor to you now. Thank you so much for the kind introductions, Margaret, and also for, of course, sharing this wonderful paper um, with the presentation, Malin. So um, as Margaret has kindly introduced, uh, I have spent some years working on circular economy and also on waste. Um, waste itself is actually a very interesting word because we do live in a closed system of the planet, right? We all live on this planet Earth and there's really no way out, okay? So one of us was buried outside of the planet, but that's it. So we're living and dying on this planet. And so nothing gets in or out technically, uh, except for meteors and asteroids. But all that aside, um, when we think about waste, it's actually taking resources from the planet, using it for whatever humanly, humanly need we need for, we need them for, and then we dispose of it, as in that we put them aside and somewhere else. So um, there's this controversy that's called uh, not in my backyard. I think many of us might have heard about that. Uh, short, uh, in short, it's NIMBY, N-I-M-B-Y. And so waste is really a NIMBY problem because as long as you stash it somewhere else where it is out of sight, it is out of my mind at least. 
so um, I see that a lot of us come from Western countries, myself included. I was born in Hong Kong and I was raised in Canada. So um, waste is a thing that, uh, well, as long as we put in the bin or in the receptacle or in the trash can, whatever you call it, then it's great, right? So that's the, the, the culture that we were, um, we were brought up in for many of us. Unfortunately, um, I have experienced it firsthand now, now that I'm living in a developing country, I understand this the other way around. When you're on the receiving side of waste, things are very different and it's in their backyards that our waste ends up. So um, it's very meaningful for us to consider all things um, to do with waste. And I commend Malin and also um, the organization of um, Wellbeing uh, Economy Alliance for having this wonderful briefing paper that acts as a very good starting point for all of us to actually really think about these concepts. And some of these concepts technically um, do not have anything to do with us seemingly, right? It looks like it's someone else's business. For example, planned obsolescence. We've all heard about how Apple actually changes their things around every few years and that you need to buy a new one and that there's really no way of us repairing some of these things because it costs more to repair a new one. And so we're familiar with these concepts and we tend to actually live with them as we go along, as we survive in this modern day world. We do need these things. These are not just guilty pleasures, but necess necessities. However, these concepts are demented from the first place, right? Because this is not how things used to be and they shouldn't be that way because we do generate so much waste and this waste at the expense of, first of all, the other people whose backyards we're actually dumping this waste in. And secondly, is that whose resources are we taking? It's our resource. There is a concept called tragedy of the commons that you may have heard of. And so tragedy of the commons usually is spelled out by um, a simple story of uh, fishers around a lake. If they take enough to actually just survive, technically they have enough for everybody to live happily, but not very affluently. Okay, but if some people started fishing a lot more, then some of us will see that, oh, actually, you can gain a lot more from that. And there are financial gains from it in this modern day world and capitalist world. And so we tend to actually take more of that. How does that actually affect waste? Technically, the commons is actually things that are accessible by everybody, including the space to put waste. And so some of the people, interestingly, think of our oceans as a place to just hold waste. Um, there are things that live in it, but so what? The, the oceans are very big. And so a lot of people tend to think that we can actually dump almost an unlimited amount of waste into the oceans. And that's actually, unfortunately, um, what a lot of people have been doing. Some of us may be lucky enough to have the, to receive the higher education and also the, the, the teachings from our, our parents and from school that littering is wrong. But unfortunately for many of us, um, that is a really a, a luxury. And so um, many of us have not received that education. We just simply look at this massive void that is called the ocean. And we think that, oh, we can just put waste in that. And so quite a lot of things happen. And these two concepts, whenever we actually generate waste, we transfer it somewhere else and it's out of sight. And the people who may be dealing with it tend to feel that, oh, we can actually just throw it into these voids that are just forests or the desert or the oceans that, well, apparently it affects nobody else anyway, right? And the answer is of course, no, right? And so that's also why I invite you to really think about waste again, because every single day we generate waste, no matter how much we want to prevent waste, no matter how much we want to be zero waste, there will be waste coming out of us. And so at this point, it is time to rethink the system because we're at this point that we've noticed these things are, are looming crises in the, in the horizon, or sometimes we're already suffering from them. A lot of the fish, fishing villages in the area where I live um, have already succumbed to too much waste uh, uh, um, amassing around the coastline, and they have to venture out much further out into like in, deeper into the oceans to find the fish that they were previously able to harvest from around the shores. This creates quite a lot of danger and especially when they have no safety gear. And so it's actually other people's lives at risk um, when we talk about this thing that's so negligible, so out of sight, such as waste. 
And so um, I commend once again, um, the paper and what it's, um, it's as far as to do. And the fact that there is the refusal as some of the um, key call to actions in this paper is really something that many of us who are actually living in more affluent parts of the world can do. We do have that luxury to carry our own bag, especially if you are driving a vehicle. Like in Canada, many people actually have to drive. There's just really very few um, forms of tra public transport. In parts of Europe, there's actually a lot more public transport and therefore you can actually take public transport. But otherwise you have this journey planned and you can actually create um, less waste by carrying your own bag carrying your own vessels so that when you purchase anything, uh, when you actually have to make some, such purchases in your life that you generate much less waste from packaging. So some of us are um, not just consumers. Some of us, so for example, myself um, in my past life in the private sector, we make also decisions for um, the private sector, which is actually um, taking, um, taking advantage of the fact that we can extract resources from the planet, sell it for gains, and also obtain the gains for our own use. And so for some, those of us who actually are making those decisions, I invite you to really think about everything that you do for your products and for your services to see if that's uh, all the things that are generated, whether or not they're necessary, whether or not they actually have the right to repair, whether or not it actually has unplanned obsolescence or planned obsolescence as addressed by this paper. And this is actually a very simple call to action for those of us who are sitting in those um, places or, or, um, or positions of decision-making power to make those choices for the rest of us who are only consumers and only, only have very basic influence to this whole process. And so we, we can do our part as consumers and as, as decision makers. And so I invite you to also challenge the status quo by um, talking to your favorite um, shops or your service providers to ask them, how do you actually view the problem of waste? What do you think about circular economy? And how do you think we can actually reboost um, recycling? The reason why I use the word reboost is because um, many of us may be aware that recycling has deeply and sharply declined over the course of the last decades. Um, it simply put, it's actually sometimes better financially to use virgin materials than, than to use recycled materials. And that is actually a huge deal because in a capitalist world, money talks. And so um, why bother paying extra money for something that is actually sometimes of, um, of poorer uh, quality and also of uh, less stability and also of lower impurity uh, levels so that um, we, we, and instead of that, we use something that's actually um, cheaper and, and uh, already in the, in the same, um, harm, like in the same homogenized um, like fashion. And so we do need to actually challenge the status quo by talking to um, members of the parliament or whoever's presenting your group making uh, government and decision-making bodies to actually tax virgin materials. Otherwise, this is all a brilliant and lovely call to action for those of us who care, but for the rest of us who are less exposed to the problems and severity of the problems actually, we'll have no choice but to follow what everyone else is doing. And unless we actually tax virgin materials and also create systems where we can actually give back into the community by um, injecting these used materials, and so that they can actually be, um, it, it be part of the circular economy. Otherwise, we're really just talking about beautiful words. So this is a great start with this briefing paper. And um, for those of us who actually spend the time to call in, I assume that you do have a personal passion for um, sustainability and for circularity. It's time to do more than what we, can, what we do as a consumer, more than just bringing your own bag, more than just refusing the straw, it is time to actually make sure that um, the policies are in place so that it facilitates this type of circularity that's being encouraged in the paper. And so we, knew, we do need to reach out. And now it's actually the best time because as of last year, um, the United Nations uh, uh, Environment Assembly came together with all the member states of the United Nations to come together to agree upon a global treaty 
on plastics, which is one of the, if not just the only one, but one of the key waste problems of our generation. And this, the problem of this generation actually will accumulate to the next generation. As we know, we find old plastics from decades ago. And so this problem will continue to amass into a much greater form if we stop caring about it right now. And so this is the perfect time to reach out to your um, local rep representatives, either local or national representatives, for them to take action. And I'm very pleased to tell you that in my home country of Canada, they have in place a policy already, one of the first in the world. They're willing to actually forego um, some of their industries that rely on plastics. They're going to stop exports of single-use plastics um, in the next few years, in interestingly. And so it takes quite a lot of guts, um, so to speak, for them to actually cut out an entire industry in order for us to actually work on the problem of waste. So I commend them for that, but I also ask you to rethink and also look them up. Um, what is your country or your region doing for plastics and also for circularity and also in the general problem of waste? I've been talking for quite long, so I'll stop here for questions and also for Margaret to um, intervene again. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Maggie. That was a really inspiring reflection on, um, on this topic. Um, and I think, as you mentioned, so important to not only think about the environmental impacts, but also the impacts in terms of uh, inequalities and social justice. Um, and of course, yeah, for all of us to lead from where we are in terms of what we can do to help um, address this issue. Marlene, did you wanna, want to perhaps come in and, and respond to some of the reflections that Maggie shared. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Marguerite. And thank you so much, Maggie, for joining us and sharing your thoughts. It's always a pleasure to, to have you. Um, what I, I came to think of, what I would just like to, to build upon uh, would be the, the connection to, to our history and our culture and, and like how, how we uh, look at our like behavior. Um, like one, one uh, uh, discussion that's been very central here in Sweden where I'm located, working a lot with the transition towards a circular economy on plastics here is the connection between education and looking at uh, more engineering topics um, or STEM education and specifically circular economy and, and like processes um, related to that. But on the other side, uh, on the other hand, looking at humanities and, and looking at uh, our history and our, our collective uh, memories and culture and how we really need to, to bridge that gap so that we truly understand uh, where we're heading and why we are heading somewhere and why the technicalities of, of our history or of, of our current practices need to switch. So um, that would just be what would be popping up on my mind. Uh, thank you so much. Fantastic. Um... I think it would be a good time now to open up the floor for everyone. I've seen so many um, great suggestions already come in through the chat and examples of things that are happening in people's local areas. And I see that Roland has a burning question. So I'd, <laughs> I'd like to hand over the, the floor to you, Roland. No, Margaret, thanks very much. I, as I mentioned the word education, it just absolutely brought home the work that I'm doing at the present time with the Royal Meteorological Society in the UK on not so much curriculum reform, but interpreting curricula in the light of the climate emergency. And that part of which, which I'm tasked to hone in on is of course economics. And it's the more I see of what's going on in schools and in many of the other media outlets that people use educationally, the more I'm horrified by the misinformation that's coming out everywhere that just reinforces the type of consumerism that uh, uh, accepts built-in obsolescence that makes it so hard for us to actually get a climate of opinion where politicians feel that they can take the sort of action that they know we should be taking at the present time. So I'd be really interested to hear from both speakers about how one can change using the media, new media, any means one can through education to get that sort of transition in a, of awareness that links the degree of significance of the climate emergency with the degree and speed of action that we need to be taking. That's a really important question. Thanks so much, um, Roland. Um, 
Maggie or Malin, would you like to respond to this question about education and, and raising awareness? Sure. I also caught uh, a few buzzwords there, Roland. Thank you so much for raising this. As mentioned, um, in many parts of the world, we are um, enjoying the luxury of being able to have this uh, or, or being exposed to this education that teaches us, hey, there's a, there's a sense of public uh, good stewardship here. Um, we shouldn't litter. So we should take good care of the environment. Um, survival is actually not even something that's guaranteed for many people, especially now that we know that there's a there's a deadly earthquake in Turkey and Syria and that people there are just trying to survive. And there's been a civil war in Syria for so many years. And so uh, it's totally a different case there that um, they're facing problems of another magnitude. And so um, either extreme put aside first, but if we take the average human being, um, we are not fluent. Most average human beings do not have a computer that's good enough to join the Zoom. And so I would imagine that those of us who have this luxury of joining now are of average lifestyle. And so for that to actually be imposed, for us to think education is like for the average human being is almost unfathomable. And that's also what a lot of these uh, grassroots organizations set out to do. So um, there are now many different projects that are on ground um, in different parts of the world, especially where the plastic um, pollution problems are considered to be a hotspot. There are two types of hotspots. One type is the production of plastic um, in, in the marine environments, and another one's accumulation. It may not be correlated because of the ocean currents, but let's just think about these for one second. Many of these places are still trying to get their kids out to actually fish and just support the family. And they don't really have this luxury of education as mentioned. And so right now we're trying to make sure that there would be, um, there would be gained for them. For example, can, can we get fishermen to fish back ghost gear that are already um, wreaking havoc on our marine um, ecosystems, trapping um, wildlife unnecessarily? And so these are some of the things that people are trying to match um, connecting the dots, and then also uh, tapping into these fishing communities to teach their children um, what they can do to alleviate the problem and to avoid worsening this um, waste problem. And so there are many of these different projects ongoing, especially with the facilitation of something that's called plastic credits. So you may have heard of carbon credits, and plastic credits is a very similar um, thing to have, is that there are many good projects that are taking back, collecting waste plastics, and they are also attempting to recycle a lot of that. And so each time they do this with one ton of plastic, either collecting one ton or recycling one ton, they do generate one credit. And that's also why as people who live in places that can afford computers and cell phones and iPads, we can vote with our wallets. And so we can reach out to our service providers, to our favorite manufacturers and say, how, are you facilitating the removal of waste plastics from the planet? For sure, everything that we buy has to do with plastics right now. Um, either they're disposable or they're a lo little bit more permanent, but still plastic is always in the equation. We can reach out to ask them, are you facilitating the overall clearing out of plastic work in developing regions, for example? We can, we can for sure demand that as a paying customer because that is our right. And so we should exercise that right and vote with our wallets so that companies that are addressing the problem and actually really hitting the nail on the head, addressing that and also helping to solve the problem are the ones that we buy from. And so that's number one. Number two is that I think Roland mentioned the climate crisis. The climate crisis sometimes is actually seen as two different things from the waste problem. However, they are interconnected, but not extremely directly connected. Um, we know that the generation of plastics from petrochemicals require this, um, the extraction of petrochemicals, but it does not re require combustion of the material per se. So um, it's not combusting fossil fuels like what we would do with airplanes and, with, and, um, and engines, right? So overall, we know that there is a looming, like there is a much bigger problem with the climate crisis than waste problems. So sometimes people tend to say, I want to choose the lesser of the two evils, right? And that's what people usually are inclined to say when they can only choose one. But I also want to challenge you by saying that we can address both problems at once. There are many um, environment crediting uh, systems out there that have co-benefits. So aside from actually alleviating by uh, the climate crisis by 
capturing carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, they may also be able to actually um, collect plastic waste and also recycle plastic waste. And this is also now gaining popularity in the banking industry because they see that um, killing two birds with one stone is better. I hate that saying. We should say saving two birds with one plan, okay? So instead of killing two birds with one stone. So there are multiple benefits that come from these novel ideas. And that's also why um, we should actually be um, more pensive about these different solutions and more welcoming to novel um, innovative solutions that come our way in terms of solving the waste and also the climate uh, crisis. Thanks. Great, thank you, um, Maggie. Marlene, did you perhaps also want to come in on the educational educational perspective? Um, wow, thank you so much, Maggie. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking what, what we have been discussing uh, here, and, and by we, I mean in the group that has been uh, working specifically with the connection between education and circular economy and just transitions is to, it's more like a formally uh, way, but it's actually to ask, in, in Sweden, we're asking the educational system to report back to the government to see how the connections are strengthened between engineering topics and humanities, and, and then vice versa, like how do you incorporate circular economy, thinking, welding economics um, in humanity topics? Um, so, I mean, it's 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 a way more structured way of, of working with it, but at least it's from a, a national level. And when you when you like find those gaps and you try to at least from a, a reporting perspective, because that would be the first step. So otherwise, you wouldn't know what you would be working with. Um, that that could actually be be some a starting point, and that could also be applicable for for organizations, like whatever policies or whatever um, a strategies you're 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 working with, look at them and see what are the gaps? Do, are there any gaps looking at a, from a zero waste perspective or a just transitions perspective and how could we fill them? But start with, with mapping them up, uh, trying to identify the gaps and, and then to see what, what actions you could take from there. Brilliant, thanks for that, Malin. Um, yeah, so just to emphasize that we really appreciate your reflections and your thoughts and um, or we want to make this as interactive a session uh, as possible. So, so if you have any questions, feel free to either pose them directly by um, raising your hand, uh, or of course you can put them put them in the chat. Um, maybe for now, I was also wondering, like there seem to be these. Um, we talk a lot about plastics when we talk about zero waste um, of course and then paper is often presented as like the the green alternative but of course then there's deforestation as well what are your what are your um uh reflections on paper versus plastic and how can we best navigate the different ways in which these different materials impacts on the environment so if i may um, jump I in um yeah yeah please maggie Sorry. Yep. Um, if I, I, I'd ask a theoretical question, right? If you were in the Sahara, would you want to wash your steel spoon? Probably not, right? You probably want to save that clean water that you can wash your spoon with to drink. Mm -hmm. So it really depends where you are. And so, if would you want to wrap your soup in paper? Um, probably not as well, right? So. That question came up quite early on in the in, in this overall um, journey to zero waste. Um, and so with the WWF entity that I work for in Singapore, we created something called the alternative material tool for um, a regular shopkeeper or a small business owner. If you run a restaurant or a small hotel or like a, a small deli, um, what can I actually use instead of virgin plastics, which is we know, as we know, virgin plastics are rarely recycled now, especially for food contact materials, because they tend to get contaminated. And so they just go down the garbage, they don't end up anywhere else. And as garbage, they either get landfilled or incinerated. And there's really nothing else to that, right? So right now, we, we are thinking of plastic as one thing. But uh, is the spoon the same as a bag? A spoon has to retain that shape. A bag is has to hold things. It has to have the volume, but then it can be in any shape. You can fold it into anything. Um, a bag needs to be printed most of the time, whereas a spoon has no printing. It can be in any color. 
And so that's also why it makes much more sense for us to look at everything separately case by case. It is a lot of trouble. It's cumbersome to think about it that way. But the whole point of always grouping up things and hoping that there's a one size fits all solution to everything is the reason why we have this monster called plastic in the first place. Um, not, no offense to Malin and her country, but the person who invented the, the plastic bag was Swedish. And he thought he could save trees by inventing plastic bags. That's such a noble attempt to help the planet. Unfortunately, it became completely out of proportion and we have this sick like dependency on plastics. And so that's why it completely became another monster. But the intention was so good. It was a great idea. And uh, so we can save trees. So um, if we don't think about things case by case, if we think paper better than glass or is glass better than aluminum, is aluminum better than plastics, hey, what's the context? Where are you? Is there a recycling facility nearby? Is there any way that we can pick up the trash? Let's say if it drifts off into the ocean, are you on a cruise ship? Are you in the Maldives? Are you in central USA? So all of these things matter. And so um, I invite you to really think about this case by case and think about the whole system. It's called the life cycle analysis. Think about it from, from cradle to grave, from when it's produced all the way after you're using it, when you're disposing of it, where does it go? And so if you think about it that way, you can actually come up with much better solutions for each of these cases so that um, you don't have to actually think about whether it's one thing versus another, but it's actually what's the best um, outcome or what's the best solution for this particular case. Thank you. I think that's a great point. Did you want to add to that, Mala? Yeah, I can only e echo that. Uh, it, it is context-based, really, and you have to think through the whole uh, lifespan of and even if it would be the first loop or the second loop or the fifth loop, but think about it through. And then also to, to really look at the, the specific uh, products or the categories and, and to look at what's, how, how is it working in your local context, whatever that would be. Um, and it might be, I'm, I know many discussions around it specifically within zero waste movements and, and other movements where you want to reduce waste or minimize waste it becomes a, a great burden on, on the consumer. And instead of looking at it uh, as this uh, like massive, massive challenge that would be kind of hard to grasp, uh, look at it from each of the categories and, and see how the actual material recycling works in your place and, and if it's accessible and if it's for, for um, everyone and how you actually could tap into that. And if it wouldn't be existing, look at what solutions are there and how you could help with that. So really context-based. Great, thank you. Um, a question has come in through the chat um, uh, about the, the hours. I actually see that there are several suggestions for how many hours we may need <laughs> to, uh, to solve this dilemma. <laughs> Um, I'm reading nine. This is about a, adding a six R. Um, so should we be adding something about rerouting um, our consumption to better goods? We throw over plastic, electric, uh, over conventional and better brands that take circularity um, seriously. So I think you've, you've touched on that a little bit. Did you want to maybe elaborate on that a little bit further? How many hours? Yeah, do you I can. Need? <laughs> I mean, there are many. I think the most the, the, the most hours I've seen has been like twenty two, okay. um, and I, I think this is this is uh, as long as it's helpful. I would say use the hours. I mean, it could be A's, it could be B's, it could be anything. But we need to be very concrete and and very uh, to to just drag it down from this uh, uh, very uh, high level strategy level to to just like what actions could I take? What mindset could I use? Uh, and then we, we don't have the time to to um, <laughs> to think about it and analyze it and, and maybe prioritize these hours for for more years. It's like we have we know that we need some sort of uh, easy strategy to take the first steps. And whatever you feel would be the most helpful for you, please go ahead and do it. Like it's it's a uh, yeah whatever works would be would be good. But there are, as I said there are many many hours and, and we, we need them, all of them. Um, it's just uh, a matter of the mindset. That's fantastic, love that, thank you. Um, Simon, I see that you have a question. Yeah, great uh, great presentation and great conversation. Um, thanks, Malin and, and Maggie. Um, 
I wanted to pick up on the last one of the last points about the burden being on the consumer and on the individual. And I, I, I struggle. I think that's a really important. It's really important part of the of the of the jigsaw, if you like, in terms of bringing about the change. But um, I, I do feel that we need to reflect more on the more structural and sort of systemic um, causes, the root causes. I think you mentioned, Madeline, and you know, it, it, it does go back to an, an economic system that generates growth, that exploits nature, that um, uh, and and generates waste, and that. Uh, you know, it's not just growth, it's also accumulation and profit, that these are the motives behind, you know, these are the big driving motives. So all of these R's, however many there are, for me, seem like common sense. And some people would say common sense is the least common of all the senses, right? But but this is common sense. I mean, it's just, just it's good for the planet, it's good for us. And, and yet it doesn't, you know, so I really struggle. I think we do. I'm, I'm part of the Wellbeing Economy Alliance as well, in the amplification team. And struggle with the question of how do we how can we accelerate the pickup of these uh this framework and and how can we um you know bring this common sense into mainstream and um, beyond these very really good examples and, and 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 viable alternatives that are being built around us how can we you know um take to scale and and really um accelerate the pickup and where are the blockers you know how do you see the block what's stopping that, that from happening that's a big, that's a tough question, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I don't expect all the answers on that, but, but it'd be good to, to have a reflection on that. Great. Can I, can I jump in? Yeah, that? I, yeah, go ahead. that's music to my ear, Simon. I think <laughs> you've just really addressed one of the root causes of why we actually have to whip up so many R's. If the system is working, why is the burden on the consumers and on people, lay people like us, right? So I was just a, a regular office employee and then just notice that hey doesn't make sense what we're pumping out where is this all going and that's also why I chose to go down this route of being an environmentalist it's because nobody else is doing anything so um it's this weird sense of duty that made us that that assembled us in this web web webinar today and so um why is the burden not on the government and those who have oversight on this they're paid to actually be the ones who set up the rules why is there no such thing called the right to profit? If you don't actually satisfy all these requirements, you simply cannot profit from, from the system. Isn't that supposed to be the, like when you adopt a child, you have to go through the interviews. You have to actually be, be present yourself in a way that I am going to be a good parent. But why isn't this the case when we're actually extracting resources from the planet and then just pumping it out as waste? So um, there's no such regulation and no oversight. And so my dream is for us to actually come up with a strategy so that the right to profit is first examined and proven by those who are trying to bank in on our natural resources. And then once they can prove that they are um, relatively um, um, environmentally neutral, then they can actually go on and pitch their um, products and services to us consumers. We shouldn't be the ones who are carrying a billion things on our bodies, a straw, a spoon and everything to actually just really um, like just live as a modern day person. So I hope somebody is, uh, is, is out there thinking about the same thing. And I hope that we can come together to act on this because I hope that I will lose my job one day because the planet doesn't need us to protect because governments are actually working to do that. Great. Can I ask you, Malin, to maybe come in on this question? I know that you've been working on, I think, on structural barriers and norms in the transition uh, in Sweden. I know we've only got two minutes left, so um, so we might have to give, keep it a little bit short, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I will, I will keep it super, super short. But yeah, we have been looking at uh, all the strategies uh, that the Swedish government has been uh, planning or being implementing uh with the aim of tapping into a circular economy and what the gaps are for uh accelerating like a shifting behavior a shift in norms and that's not at the consumer consumer level that's among uh, organizations and among uh, like governments and municipalities and even though we use this uh, thematic uh foundation for the analysis mapping up all the policies and, and finding those gaps and and analyzing it from from this kind of uh, more like structural or, or altering the path perspective, transformational at the society level, uh, it all all the theories 
comes back down to the individual, but not as consumers, because it's us working in governments and it's us making the legislation and it's us working in, in businesses, forming some internal policies or external policies. And, and there we can make a massive change, but we need to bridge those gaps. So um, yeah, I could only echo what Maggie has been saying about the consumer level and remind ourselves that we are individuals in many different contexts where we actually can use our power to influence what's happening. Now, otherwise we might know somebody who could. So use our voice. Fantastic. I think that's a, that's a brilliant, brilliant um, closing yeah, for our session today. So our session um, is coming to an end. I've loved the conversation and I've also loved reading the paper on zero waste, especially uh, all these inspiring examples of, of what is possible. So thanks so much again to our two fantastic speakers and all the people in our wider membership who've contributed um, to this paper. Um, if you're in the audience and you'd like to become part of the wellbeing economy movement, I would encourage you to become a member of WHEEL um, so that you can engage more directly with all of the brilliant people in our network uh, and the work that's happening here. So with this, I'd like to thank you um, for taking the time to be here with us today. Uh, and I look forward to um, seeing you and collaborating with you all again soon. Thanks so much, everyone.